Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Demand Gen Reports Strategy and Planning Series. This webinar is called Connect, Target, and Activate the Buyer Experience, dot, 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 in less than 60 days. My name is Claudia Tarigo, and I'm the editor of Demand Gen Report, and I will be your moderator for this presentation. Before we kick things off, I'm going to run through a few housekeeping slides to make sure everybody is on the same page, and then we will get things started. First up, if you are new to Demand Gen Report, welcome. We are an online media company that publishes everything from daily news briefs uh, to original research to special reports and a rich menu of additional resources. Uh, so if you haven't done so already, join more than 75,000 subscribers to our weekly newsletter by subscribing to demandgenreport.com today. And then of course, during and after today's session, please follow along and share your thoughts and feedback with us on Twitter and LinkedIn. You can use the hashtag SPS21 and then, of course, all of our handles uh, and links are right here on your screen. I'm also super excited to announce that uh, we are going back to Scottsdale after, you know, a long 18 plus months of quarantine uh, for the B2B Marketing Exchange this February. Um, we will be at the Phoenician in Scottsdale this time around to host uh, a big three day event for B2B marketing and sales professionals. Uh, registration is now open and we will be updating the agenda and speaker pages uh, in the next few months. So. So uh, check out the website, it's b2bmarketing.exchange, and you can even sign up for updates to get more information. We're also really excited to be partnering with our friends at Grubhub once again to offer some lucky attendees a free lunch while they enjoy the series. So really all you have to do is uh, find and ho hopefully find an email from Grubhub in your inbox um, and you'll be able to access that free lunch credit. For this presentation, we'll be using the On24 platform, and during the uh, session, you could access really everything you need right on this toolbar that's kind of mapped out on the slide right here. Uh, first things first, we encourage you to ask our presenters questions today. And to do so, all you have to do is click on that Q&A widget at the top right corner of your page. Uh, the session is slated to run about 30 to 35 minutes with a few extra minutes for Q&A following the session. So you could submit those questions in that Q&A widget at any time. And then, of course, uh, we will do some Q&A um, after the session. Uh, but if we don't get to your questions live, don't worry. We will follow up via email. And then right below the Q&A widget, you'll be able to access all of the SPS sessions that we have going on this week. And then right below that, you will find some additional resources that we've made available to you. In addition to joining the conversation online and uh, submitting your questions, of course, uh, we also uh, welcome you to let us know how we're doing so we could continue to improve our virtual events to your liking. So we've put together a, a very short survey that will automatically launch when this presentation ends. And you could even also pull up, complete, and submit the survey at any time during the session by clicking on the survey icon uh, at the bottom of your screen. And you could see it circled on the slide there. It's that green little icon. So uh, before signing off today, please take a moment to uh, just take this quick questionnaire so we could continue to enhance our events. Finally, uh, today's session is being recorded and all of our attendees will receive an archive link to the presentation to go back and review and share with colleagues. All right, well, I think that is it with housekeeping slides. So now I'm so excited to introduce our featured speakers for today. We have Heather Loisel and Jerry Nichols of Bottom Line Technologies and Nicole Henry of Dunn and Bradstreet. And I'm gonna just, uh, uh, share some of their bios here so you could get to know them a little better. Jerry is currently the global head of marketing analytics at Bottom Line Technologies, where he leads the development, syndication, and scaling of business intelligence, advanced ad analytics, and data strategies to generate demand, simplify the buying and selling process, and increase brand awareness. Prior to joining Bottom Line in 2020, he built and led the advanced analytics and measurement practices for companies such as SAP Global Marketing and Communications, SAP North America, and Cisco Systems. 
Heather is a leader in B2B marketing, sales, go-to-market strategy, and operations. Her experience focuses on growth and spans 25 plus years in organizations ranging in size from uh, $30 million to $10 billion. She is currently the SVP of Marketing Operations for Bottom Line Technologies. But previously, she was the CMO at Ryco USA and was responsible for leading their transformation from a product mindset to a customer-oriented approach in solution offerings, sales strategy, marketing campaigns, and digital transformation. And of course, last but not least, Nicole leads marketing strategy, campaigns, and programs for Dun & Bradstreet's sales and marketing division's data management portfolio. She has held product marketing leadership roles within the ad tech space and has worked with many digital startups, one of which was acquired by Accenture. So we are in really great hands today. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass things over to Nicole to kick things off. All yours, Nicole. Great, thank you, and good morning and afternoon, depending where you're joining from today. I have the pleasure to be joined here today by our partner and customer, Bottom Line Technologies. And as Claudia mentioned, we have Jerry Nichols, Global Head of Marketing Analytics, and Heather Loisel, SVP of Marketing Operations, joining today's webinar. Before we hand it off to the Bottom Line team, to share their story, I wanted to share some key trends that we're seeing in the market. So to start, I wanted to share some key points called out by both Gartner and McKinsey, all of which underscore the future of data and its societal effects specifically on businesses. Today, companies are really trying to grow while fight you know, fraud and security and other risks and dis disruptions that come along with data. And in a way, they're fighting on two fronts, fighting on keeping up with the data coming into the organizations while trying to manage all of the data that's coming in. So it's really challenging for organizations, especially like the small and medium-sized organizations, to do this well. When we take a step down from the macro view that I just shared, there are really three key trends shaping the future of sales and marketing. One, privacy. You know, our buyers have gone digital. Companies are chasing buyers, you know, allocating more marketing budget to really reach them appropriately. But it's really overwhelmed the digital buyer. It's caught and causing concern for more control and privacy over how you reach them or how companies reach them. And as we head towards, you know, a cookie-less world in the next couple of years, collecting and managing first-party data will become a top priority. Secondly, personalization. So, you know, while buyers don't want to deal with the digital noise that they deal with day in and day out, they do want us to make the buyer, buyer journey more personalized and efficient for them. And in the wake of COVID-19, reaching the buyer with a message that really resonates with them is actually becoming even more important with, the, with remote work becoming the norm, really accelerating organization to perfect the digital buying experience. And lastly, proliferation. In our race to reach buyers on more and more challenge cha channels, marketing and sales teams are managing an overwhelming number of tools. In fact, 60% of go-to-market teams are using more than 20 different tools at any given time. They really need solutions that are open and flexible to leverage their existing investments that can connect seamlessly to these tools and workflows. When you learn and map the digital buying experience, you realize truly how complex the buyer journey is. And today, many organizations are inefficiently engaging with their customer and buyer. In fact, uh, in a recent report that we just commissioned, we learned how well or poorly sales marketers or rev op leaders are engaging their customers. In, Dun & Bradstreet's eighth annual B2B data report, which will be coming out shortly. We surveyed over 600 plus professionals. And what we learned is that only 34% of respondents have seen an improvement in their sales and marketing in the past 12 months, which to many might not be surprising given the pandemic, but what will be is how these 34%, what we're calling the high performers are doing to drive an improved performance even during a pandemic. 
when it comes to the three P's that we discussed um, in previous slides, the majority of high performers use an account-based strategy when making, making them significantly confident that their go-to-market teams are all using and are aligned with a common view of the customer, hence their high performance, right? So when it comes to prolification, more than 50% of respondents say that they are using between five to 10 tools in their day-to-day, -day, which is why you see that the top rank priority is ensuring that they get a better view of the customer because they're using so many tools, so it becomes more of a priority, right? And when it comes to personalization, high performers are 63% more confident in their ability to reach the right buyers, whereas the rest, 29%, are confident. Um, what the data essentially is telling us in summary is that those that use an ABM, an account-based marketing strategy, are more confident in reaching in-market buyers and are more likely to consider, consider a common view of the customer a priority, really resulting in being confident that their go-to-market teams are aligned with who they are reaching at any given time using data and insights. And at Dun & Bradstreet, that's our mission. We empower B2B marketing and sales teams with data, insights, and automation that they need to drive business growth. I'll now hand it off to the bottom line technologies team to share their fantastic story. So without further ado, Heather, I'll hand it off to you. Terrific, thanks, Nicole, very much. And uh, appreciate all of the support that you and uh, your teams have provided to us to get to this point. It's always an honor to be able to tell our story. And, um, you know, I have to start with hopefully a, a slide that kind of says, holy cow, what is that? Well, imagine if your data looked like this, because this is what our data looked like when we first started um, down this adventure. So um, I've been with Bottom Line as um, as was said, you know, not a whole length of time, about a year, a little over a year or so, and came in and said, "Holy cow, what's going on in our data?" Um, and as you can see from this image, you can't really see people, although you know they're there. And if you look at those oblong blocks and you consider them maybe representing accounts, you can see people and kind of see accounts. Um, but boy, there's a lot of lack of clarity here. There's multiple dimensions. And whew, if you imagine if your data looks like this, you would be a little bit dizzy. Um, this is essentially what we came to. And it, it was um, as a result of uh, the company and its history. So bottom line is a company that whose growth is fuel, has been fueled by acquisitions. Now we've got terrific growth um, over the past few years. But as the company has grown, it has acquired companies and new capabilities. And there's a fundamental principle about bottom line, even though it's about a $480, $490 million company, we're publicly traded ePay on the NASDAQ, um, each line of business operates autonomously. So um, they have their P&L and they have their customer set. They have their own sales objectives. They have their own go-to-market plans. And marketing is one of the only shared services that crosses all LOBs. So our internal customers, of course, are um, our sales and line of business and go-to-market and our product teams. And our external customers are, of course, the ones that we're trying to delight. Um, but it's hard to do when you have a view of data that is very line of business focused. Um, so we had to step back and really think about how we were going to approach this. And we're really fortunate for a couple of reasons. One is, um, that I was able to bring Jerry over to join us. You can notice in our in our bios that Jerry and I both worked at SAP um, and having the opportunity to do this in other places that are pretty complex, we felt like we could do uh, we could do something here. And one of the first things that we did was we said, okay, the most successful companies have sales, marketing, and product aligned. And so we decided to start primarily with sales and marketing. So what does alignment really mean? And the definitions were put out by um, serious decisions um, in uh, the first really big, broad buyer user survey that they did um, in 2017, and they've continued since then, to um, survey customer performance relative to alignment. So they unpacked it, and they said, all right, well, here's what alignment really means. 
you have the same ideal customer profile. And that ideal customer profile is in marketing lists and sales territories and is the focus that everybody is, um, is spending their time on. So if you think about that image that you just saw on the previous slide, holy cow, getting to a point where we have an ideal customer profile and then a single source of truth in that ideal customer profile, those are really critical. Um, it was really important for us to think about how we put that in place, but how do we do it and not really disrupt the business? Because the way you used to do things is um, try to get all the business process the same in your, in your operational systems, like Salesforce. And, you know, that's hard to do if you're operating as different lines of business. So what we needed to do was to think about a different way to solve that problem. And you already know the punchline, Dun & Bradstreet um, was our partner in this. Um, we also wanted the ability to really look at a single view of the customer, a single view of contacts, align it to our ideal customer profile, know how many of those folks we had, and then have the ability to market to those um, ideal customer uh, contacts in those accounts um, through multiple channels. Because we know when you have multiple channels and integration of sales and marketing touches, you end up with the most effective output. Because the buyer gets to see, okay, there are human interactions, there are digital interactions, some are sales, some are marketing. That's what they go through in their buyer journey. So our goal in starting this is we got this aspirational goal about alignment, but we're starting from a place where we don't have a common view of accounts. We don't have a common view of contacts and our data really did look like that visual. So we asked ourselves basic questions. How many accounts and contacts do we currently have and how many of them can we get? So because we didn't understand accounts and clarity of unique accounts, we couldn't really tell. Then we wanted to know what was our specific coverage of those accounts and contacts within our ideal customer profile. So imagine we had a bunch of contacts, we had a bunch of accounts, we have Salesforce and Marketo, coincidentally we have a little part out in here too, and we said how do we figure out that single view and then how do we know how much of that ICP we cover with that single view? Inevitably there's a gap, right? And that's our goal is to identify that gap and fill it so that we can go to market effectively. Again, to get back to where we wanted to be, which is customers see us engaging them on their needs and we have sales, marketing and product all kind of talking the same language and taking the same approach. So it's a pretty complex thing to do. And this is where I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry because he actually knew how to do it. Jerry? Awesome, thank you, Heather. And also thank you, Nicole. What I'd love to do now is, is spend a few minutes talking about how we made the data actionable and specifically what we did. So a little bit from a timing perspective, Heather joined bottom line of September of 20, I joined in December. So one of our first initiatives, as Heather mentioned, she started a few months before me, was signing the DMV contract, uh, which provided that linkage for Marketo between accounts and contacts. In the, in the past, we only went to market by uh, job titles and profiles. And so the first phase is what we would call fixing the data. We literally sent Dun & Bradstreet, our entire Marketo database. They came back and said, you know what? Your, your contacts, we know which ones are valid. And we also know what the, the connection is between your contacts and accounts. So when we first did it, like people were a little, you know, it was outside their comfort zone a little bit. It's the first time that we'd ever done that, but we purposely stayed away, as Heather mentioned, from any operational systems. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So that was the first step is really understanding what is that coverage in our Marketo perspective from an account perspective and also from a contact perspective. That also provided some very powerful insights about where we might be missing contacts because now we had the ability to say, hey, is that contact company in Marketo a customer or non-customer? So a lot of things that we could do right away just in linking Marketo and our contacts together. Now, the second phase, we had such good success for that that, that Christine um, Nurnenberg, our CMO said, you know what? We need to get Salesforce on board. So she actually 
funded the first kind of phase for our sales force cleanup. So in this phase, what we did is we coupled Marketo and Salesforce together for the first time ever at an account level and also at a contact level. So pretty quickly, uh, that was probably all online by April, I would say, and loaded into to all our backend platforms in Snowflake. The next phase was using the data. For the first time ever, we were able to couple uh, account information from Salesforce from Marketo to our customers to understand our true market penetration rates. How many companies are in the universe? How many we have in our database? What that looks like from a customer, non-customer, and how we can then prioritize all our contact acquisition, buying center, a whole host of analytics. So Heather's gonna talk in a little bit more on the next slide uh, coming up in two is um, how we really use this to create fact-based go-to-market plans and how we're working closely with our enterprise analytics team to operationalize this. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we purposely stayed away from our operational systems. We're putting it in a snowflake environment. We're putting Power BI on top of it to give it our visibilities. And then we can deploy campaigns and use the output of that. And, Heather's going to have a few examples in a minute. So next slide here is just really talking about our data transformation. So I talked a little bit about in FY21 around how we had to focus on data quality, data governance, fixing the quality of our data. Really now we already started to use the operational data to improve our uh, uh, operational performance, but this really is a foundation that we built to take the organization to the next level. So we recently launched our uh, revenue operations team, which is going to be creating a closer alignment between marketing and sales, and then also product. It's a three-prong, all, all geared towards doing two key things, one, accelerating time to revenue because we understand who the companies are, you know, what our coverage is, the handoff between sales and marketing, but also to increasing the customer delight, that overall customer experience. So in the interest of time, Heather, I'd like to turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about how we actually use this to advance the organization. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, how we used it. So on one hand, you could say, okay, that's great bottom line, no big deal. So you know who your universe is, you added Dun & Bradstreet to it, you reconciled it, you figured out how many you had, you figured out how many you needed. Um, so that answers one question. But the next question then is, well, what do you do with it? Well, what we did was we took that um, ideal customer profile and that baseline was really the beginning of the planning strategy. So our fiscal year happens to end on June 30th. We start a new fiscal year, July 1. So through the first um, two quarters, calendar quarters of this year, we really worked with the teams to use this view of customers and accounts and contacts as the foundation for their go-to-market plan. They could now take a look at, all right, well, Here's how many we have. Here's how many we need to get to. And by the way, it's not everybody, but it's our ideal customer profile. So that means specific enterprise sizes, um, which is asset or revenue, depending on the industry, industry, the roles that you're, you were going after, the functions that you were going after. And so we really narrowed things down. When you get a sales leader that says, I want to market to, any, to anybody you know, in the United States or around the world over $50 million, that's just too big because a billion dollar organization buys completely differently than a $50 million organization. Um, the next thing we did because we now had that ideal customer profile is we laid them on top of each other. And this is really fun when you get a um, line of businesses that only want to think in their silos, because when you lay them on top of each other, you create a Venn diagram and the Venn diagram says, okay, here's where you're kind of standalone going against these contexts and accounts. But, and here's where you're kind of going standalone, but in the middle is where there are two lines of business, 
three lines of business, four lines of business. Well, I'll tell you, our Venn diagrams look more like tulips because they were all overlapping um, in terms of who they were going after. Now, if you try to talk with people about this, um, you may get them to understand. You show them a picture of it and they get it. So this was really a terrific input where we took the ideal customer profile because now we could identify where there was overlap with the Dunn's number and it showed, uh-oh, there are places we need to go to market together because nothing frustrates customers more than product-oriented approaches where you're saying, do you want product A from us, product B from us, or product C from us? And the customer says, I don't know, I want you to solve my problem. What do you think? And so that was our goal was to really take that needs-based approach. We delivered this to the business in an account sizing dashboard and Power BI because we wanted them to put their hands on the keyboard and look at the data and see where the overlap was. Because again, as you're showing them they, those pictures, they get it and they want to solve it. And when you use Power BI and you have the account set up the way you do, you can use filters so they can look at it any way they want it. So different line of business leaders want to look at things differently. So it was easy for them to do that. The other thing that we added on to them, which was really important, is we added on another dashboard that looked at what marketing assets and campaigns and tactics we could actually tie back to those accounts and opportunities. So they could figure out what was used that kind of got connected to revenue. So a whole lot of inputs, some data and some visibility that they hadn't had before. And we really tried to put, get their hands on the keyboard because then they believe it a little bit more. And we provided them with a way to be able to take all that data, they're now overwhelmed by it, and put it into a useful output that helped them answer some core questions. We use this concept called an audience framework, which is, okay, let's prioritize your market. You wanna go after all these segments in your ideal customer profile, great. Big milestone to get that. Now what we want you to say is, which one do you wanna go after first? Because everybody likes to prioritize, but they wanna prioritize in buckets. They don't wanna prioritize in lines. So what do you wanna go after first? What do you want to go after second? What do you want to go after third? Because then that gives them the um, insight and the decisions to kind of say, where are we going to put all of our effort in sales and marketing? The other thing that it does when you look at it visually is that, again, it showed the overlap. So they're saying more than one line of business or more than one product offering wants to go after this first, second, and third. And then there were some outliers. It was like somebody wants to go over here. Well, that was easier for to take off the priority list because they could see how big it was, right? Because then the next thing we did after we asked them to prioritize is we really quantified it. And we used a, a pretty basic equation, which was how many accounts are there? Um, what's the average selling price? We asked them to factor in or accept a factor of about 10% of those accounts are making a decision in any one year, which is what happens when you're looking at bigger systems. Um, and then we asked them to put their thumb on the scale on where they thought that they could compete effectively right now. Not in the future, but right now. And what that ended up being is it really brought through the priorities. And it was interesting because we had them taking things on and putting things off based on that. And they've never really had a chance to pull all that together. And then finally, we led them to say, okay, if sales and marketing are really going to be together and you want to move an audience and we now who that know who that audience is, we're going to use integrated campaigns. And those are campaigns that have awareness and demand and sales enablement and customer engagement. Now, you're going to have different percentages based on what you're trying to accomplish. So if it's cross-sell, upsell, or retention, there may be more customer engagement. If it's brand new prospects and they don't know you, there's probably going to be more awareness. But it was the first time that they were really coming out of this process, able to answer the question, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? How much value can I expect? And how are we actually going to go pursue it in a more detailed way? So it was really fun and amazing. And I, I got to give a lot of credit to our teams that were able to put this together, but also our teams that were ready to absorb it because we went from, and you all know this, right? sales leaders that are kind of sitting back saying, I'm being polite on this marketing call today, to actually diving in with us, linking arms, working spreadsheets together to be able to come together with the go-to-market plan.
And it is um, just the beginning. You know, there's so many things that we want to be able to do. We want to be able to improve our lead scoring that hasn't been done for a while. There's some great tools out there for things like intent. Um, I can't wait to get um, our attribution models rolling because we now have enough information to be able to build something that's a lot more interesting than first touch or last touch. Um, Jerry, I know you've got big dreams for this too. What do you want to call out? You know, I'm really excited, Heather, about all the accomplishments we've made so far. I think some of the big areas that we want to focus next are on account-based marketing. If we think about our largest accounts, our strategic accounts, how can we provide um, insights uh, for our marketing and sales team to improve our overall buying and customer experience? I'm equally excited about our 360 view of the customer. We're starting to look at other types of data we want to include, such as um, bookings information, uh, revenue data, other sorts of data that we're starting to put together in a priority order um, to really help put together the customer journey to create uh, data-driven insights. Uh, we also want to advance from, you know, I would say descriptive reporting uh, dashboards, scorecards, databases, to more of the predictive analytics, next best purchase, uh, lead scoring, as you mentioned, uh, attribution. I think that the foundation that we built here um, through our partnership with Dun & Bradstreet and also our marketing and sales organization, um, we're, we're all ready and we're super excited for what's ahead of us. Um, it's going to be a blast. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, so this foundation is built on DNB data. And um, it is really foundation um, in terms of the cornerstone of the whole go to market has been knowing what your accounts are, being able to identify them, being able to look at different dimensions and different behaviors they have. So we're just thrilled with this. We want to thank our, our partners here. And to those of you who are facing this, um, you know, we didn't go and try to solve all the Salesforce stuff. We did it um, with some support from our CMO, obviously, with some best practices, but this is doable. So if you can't do your whole Marketo database or you can't do your whole, start small and build up because if you build it and you show it to them, they will come, they will come because everybody wants to feel more confident about the decisions that they're making. And with that, we'll turn things um, back over to Nicole. Awesome. Thank you, Heather and Jerry. Really appreciate hearing your story, as I'm sure everyone uh, on today's call did. You guys are 100% a high-performing marketing organization. That is without a doubt. Um, so, you know, we realize that every company is on their own data journey, as, you know, bottom line once was. And so for, for those trying to understand their current state of their data, we have a complementary tool called the Data Health Scan that can really help you understand where your data sits. With our data, uh, data health scan, you can receive meaningful insights such as duplicate, understanding your duplicate records or records that might be unmarketable. Um, you could better understand where your data attribute gaps sit such as firmographics and, and many other uh, attributes. Or, you know, it could provide a detailed analysis of the emails that you have in your data set. And this is just, you know, one of many um, benefits from our data health scan. So after today's webinar, please feel free to sign up to receive a free trial. Uh, there's a hyperlink on this slide. And we hope to hear from you and see how we can better help you. I just want to, again, I want to thank the bottom line team for taking the time and sharing their story. Um, and so with that, I will now move on to Q&A. Awesome, really, really, really great stuff here. Hopefully everybody got some awesome takeaways uh, from you guys, that was awesome. Um, and it did spark some really great questions, of course, but before I get to those, I just wanna remind everyone once again, please share your thoughts and feedback before logging off today. You could click that survey icon at the bottom of your screen right now, or just simply wait till the, uh, the session ends and it'll automatically launch. All right, uh, let's get to those questions. First one, what is your biggest piece of advice for someone undergoing a similar journey? 
Yeah, you know what, um, Claudia, I'm gonna I'm gonna lean in on that one and um, I, do the health scan, like do the data health scan. Um, and the reason I say that is because um, when we tried to talk about this in theory, it was hard for people to understand. Um, if you went to someone and said, "Hey," um, we analyzed our database and 30% um, of it isn't marketable. We'd like to be able to improve on that because we want 100% marketable. And this happens to be within our ideal customer profile. Don't you think that's worth making an investment? I think that the more that you can look at the business problem that you're trying to solve and put it in context for um, sales and marketing stakeholders, the better off you are. So. Look at the thing from a perspective of a business, see what sort of data and analysis you can do and um, present the data. And then you'll be giving people things that they will feel more comfortable making a decision about. So don't be afraid, but uh, really take advantage of all of the tools that are out there to be able to help analyze your data and put it in business context when you're having those conversations. Those two things together are pretty darn powerful to lead change. Awesome, good stuff. And speaking of the data health scan, uh, someone asked, what is the duration of the data health scan trial? Sure, I could take this one, Claudia. So there actually is no expiration date on the data health scan. So you can use it for as long as you'd like. The only cap is that you can only run two health scans per month, but that's really the only caveat. Awesome, good stuff. So no excuses, everyone. Everybody could try it. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Are there any best practices you could share from your program? I'll be happy to take that, uh, Claudia. So um, uh, probably three things come top of mind to me. So first, you know, include key stakeholders, business partners, and folks that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis early in the process, right? No one likes surprises. Bring them along on your journey. You know, Heather mentions folks' excitement when we built the dashboards, um, you know, to pro provide visibility into our account and contact coverage. We trained over 70 marketers and sales folks that are leveraging this platform to answer some of the business questions that Heather mentioned um, earlier um, at the beginning of the presentation. Also, you know, don't try to fix everything at once. We stayed away from our operational systems. Test and learn as you go. We first did Marketo. Check, people understood it. They understood how many accounts, how many contacts. We didn't try to do Salesforce and Marketo and Pardot and everything at the same time. The second thing I would say is have manageable milestones celebrate successes along the way. And then third, you know, have fun with this. You know, you're, you're not gonna really, we are doing marketing, it's important, but at the end of the day, it's important you have fun at the same time. So those are my three best practices. Awesome, thank you, Jerry. Um, I'm gonna cap the Q&A uh, right there. Uh, because we are coming close to uh, to our time here. Uh, but thank you again to Heather, Jerry, and Nicole for taking the time out to share their story um, and these fabulous insights. Of course, if we didn't get to your question live, like I mentioned earlier, we will definitely follow up with answers to those questions via email. So stay tuned for that. All right, well, that is a wrap on another SPS session. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you again to Heather, Nicole, and Jerry uh, for taking the time out. Um, we will have this session ready for on-demand viewing very shortly. And in the meantime, don't miss the next one. It's called Four Ways to Unpack the Power of Personalization at Scale with One-to-One, One-to-Few, and One-to-Many. It's kicking off at 3 p.m. Eastern later today. So hopefully we'll see you there. Thank you everyone again for joining us and take care.